this is the finance panel, in a way, and so we were wondering whether anyone would be in the audience, but fortunately, uh, you've all recognized that in some ways, this is the, the make or break topic about whether we're going to achieve the sustainable development goals, because if you look at all the forecasts uh, that are out there, basically somewhere between three and a half and, or six trillion dollars a year uh, needs to be added to what is being spent um, and invested in achieving those goals if they're to be achieved. And with this panel, we have three um, pioneering women in this field of actually figuring out how to finance those goals. Um, and they're going to tell us about some of the exciting things that are happening at the moment, but also what some of the challenges are that will need to be overcome if this is to really uh, scale up and, uh, and achieve the kind of impact necessary um, to actually achieve the goals. So on the far end, we have Safina Hussain, who's founder of Educate Girls, which is a pretty much self-explanatory um, and uh, operates in uh, India. Um, next to her is, is Georgie Bernadette, who runs Align 17, which is a new organization that's really trying to literally mobilize funds to achieve um, the 17 SDGs. And then next to me is Maya Cherengol, who um, is really the driving force behind the RISE fund, which um, is a $2 billion private equity fund uh, leading um, the mainstreaming of impact investing. But she has a long history in impact investing before she joined TPG, which is the, the private equity firm that, that does that. So I wanted to really start um, with, with Georgie, as you've got this big focus across all the 17 goals. You know, what do you think you know, needs to be done to, to, to really mobilize that massive extra amount of funding to, and particularly private sector funding to, private to achieve sector. the goals? Yeah, so thank you, Matthew. And indeed, right now we need to pay the bill effectively for the global goals, and it's at the tune of uh, five to seven trillion dollars a year. So obviously, the, uh, you know, we cannot do it by ours alone. It cannot happen just from the uh, development sector or the government, and we need all hands on deck. So Align 17 was founded uh, by a group of founding partners, including UBS, PwC, and the, one of the largest asset managers, um, Hamilton Lane. And uh, the idea is to mobilize the private wealth from ultra high net worth, high net worth individuals, which is in the world right now, just to have an idea, there's around $18 trillion in private wealth. How do we mobilize that, pap that capital into impactful, vetted, co-investment, direct deals. So it's a different asset class than private equity, which is Maya does. It actually gives access to these investors to direct deals alongside the likes of the, the IFC, the Global Innovation Fund, the Calvert Foundation, people that, who have in their mission to mobilize different sources of capital into impact, and they allocate a portion of their investments to these private wealth um, advisors and individuals who want to have more um, connection to where they're um, investing. So only one third of this group is actually would consider themselves impact investors, and we're targeting the other one third who are the early followers um, into something that can be very meaningful, not just from the financial return, but also by the type of community they represent. And impact investing is where you're trying to invest and make money and do good at the same time. Yes. I mean, how much of, of what you're seeing you know, in terms of the, the wealthy families, you know, do they want to do impact investing? How much do they want to do philanthropy? Yes. How much do they just still want yes. to do old style so investing? So there is one quote that I never forgot. Third generation Swiss investor, and he told me point blank, you bankers only care about basis points. We families care about real things. So there's definitely from a from a thought and you know, hard perspective, um, they not only feel a sense of responsibility, but they know that um, they need to be part um, of the solution. So the impetus is there. Also remember, there's a next generation coming on board. So you have the generation X who is very involved, and then you have their children really pushing in the boards and in the decision making, getting themselves uh, their own allocation of capital to work with towards impact. Um, trying to prove the case and then to bring the whole family uh, across over the impact side. And one sort of factual question. Yes, of I mean, I mean, how much money do we, are we talking about that's in the hands of these wealthy families? Yes, yeah, so as I mentioned, just the top 10 private um, asset managers control te $10 trillion. And so, and again, it's, for me, it's not just about the capital, it's also about the type of community they represent because these are the same people who are in the board of, you know, 
private pension funds. These are the same people who are the CEO of companies. So as they get more involved in impact with their capital, what I would hope is that they also get more involved in all their other um, you know, fields of activity. And do they find the notion of the sustainable development goals something that is attractive to them or, or is it you know, a bit too intangible? So it is a learning process. I think most of the families deeply care about an issue and it's a question of having the conversation and seeing how that issue is represented um, in the sustainable development goals. So definitely it's a framework that we're using. So PwC's role is to standardize the impact information for every deal. So you have deals that are coming from very diverse actors who measure impact differently. But if you're a non-impact investor, you want to know what that means. You want an easy way to understand it. So PwC is working with us to standardize uh, that information. So by standardizing, then they can tag one of their interests and what they care about and what they've invested in philanthropy into something that is related to the um, sustainable development goals. And Maya, there was a lot of excitement about the launch of the RISE Fund, partly because you had investors like Bono and Richard Branson and, and Jeff Skoll, Jeff yeah. Skoll <laughs> Silicon Valley people, you know. And, but I think that for me, the, the more interesting and exciting thing was that it was a very traditional private equity firm that has traditionally managed tens of billions of dollars, TPG, deciding to actually embrace a very well thought out, I think, approach to impact investing. What, what, you know, what have you, why, do you, why have they done that and what does that tell us about how we can get the, the rest of these big traditional financial institutions on board towards the sustainable development goals? I, I think there were two primary motivators. One was that um, for the, the, the key team within TPG, it was a moral imperative and it was the right thing to do. That um, we are in time where not doing something is um, tragic and could have tragic consequences. So it, it was a, a very deep-seated uh, value system that led to this. The second was that, um, just looking at the numbers, you are not going to be able to meet the outcomes that we've outlined in the SDGs with just philanthropic capital, with government aid, and with um, private wealth from individuals. You need institutional commercial capital and the capital markets to come to the table. And this was one way to bring a scaled impact fund to the table, and this was a way to give institutional investors like pension funds um, an alternative uh, for their investment portfolio where front and center for pension funds is their fiduciary responsibility to the contributors to those pension funds. They cannot compromise on financial return. They are doing a disservice in their minds to their constituents if they were to consider um, compromising the discipline around financial return. However, um, I think the pension funds have also realized that the world um, is moving to a place where incorporating not just ESG, but thinking about the good that companies do um, on a commercial basis is a fundamentally good thing. And this provided a product, if you will, for those institutional investors to come to the table and start to put capital into the impact world, which had been very difficult for them to do before because there weren't uh, funds out there that they could pass through their investment committees who said, yes, the impact is important, but we cannot compromise on the financial return element of what we do. And just, uh, I think you've done four investments now. Yes. Um, and quite a diverse set of companies. Right. Just tell us a bit about you know, what you're looking for and what makes it a suitable investment for you and what kind of money you're investing. Absolutely, so we are, um, first of all, we have uh, built a sector focus, which is the way that TPG does all of its investing. Um, and we've mapped our sectors to the sustainable development goals. So, you know, some of them are quite obvious, like um, education or healthcare, where, you know, there's really um, one, one box almost that you could look at. Um, we are a growth equity fund, so we are in the market to capitalize companies that are really at the growth phase that can benefit from having a partner at the table who can help them to scale. And um, the range of investments that we've made has 
gone up to $120 uh, million, dollars, $150 million. So we really are putting capital to work in growth opportunities. Um, a lot of the impact funds are, are smaller. Um, it's generally only been either uh, development institutions or in some cases mainstream investors who aren't really thinking about mission alignment and the intentionality of impact in their companies, but we really are stepping into that place that hasn't been well served by a mission aligned investor outside of some of the multilateral institutions. And one of the things that you're talking a lot about is, you know, I think obviously a long running issue that many impact investors have been grappling with is how do you measure progress? Yeah. You know, it's easy to measure financial returns. Yeah. But how do you measure that you're actually moving in the right direction towards the sustainable development goals? Yeah, that's a, that's a great question. So one of the fundamental contributions of the RISE Fund is that we've been able to resource against a very deep, uh, what, are we, what I'll call an impact underwriting tool. So this is a, an approach and a methodology to looking at a company, to looking at the kind of impact that it produces for its customers or beneficiaries based on the products and services that it's providing. We have linked to academic research and evidence. So one of the things that we've been able to do is build almost what I'd call a catalog across the sectors that we invest in of the deep research that has been done by a variety of academics and help inform our investing by actually looking at what products and services have actually produced impact. So we're not doing it on the basis of a tummy rub or an intuition that something might produce impact. We actually want evidence, and we call this evidence-based impact investing. There um, are a lot of man hours that have gone into the design of our approach and our tool. We did have to build it in such a way that our private equity investing team, which is used to um, single uh, numbers like investment rate of return IRR or return on investment ROI, we had to come to a quantification and an analytical standpoint for what impact is for each company that we look at. We score it and then we use that methodology to actually measure over time and help manage greater impact. So by identifying what drives impact, by looking at the outputs and the business drivers that drive impact, we can do, do a better job of managing to maximize that impact. And when we exit an investment, we can look back and say, at the beginning, what impact did we think we would produce? At the end, did we actually get there? We measure it over time and did we actually get there? What can we learn from that? Now, Safina, you're here representing the, the social entrepreneur on the ground actually you know, really mm -hmm. helping from the bottom up achieve these goals, particularly with girls, which we all know mm -hmm. educating girls is probably one of the best investments that the world can make because of the, the multiplier of the, of, of the returns that an educated girl makes so much difference to in so many different ways. Um, and what's particularly interesting, I think, about educating girls is you've recently pioneered um, the first development impact bond mm -hmm. Um, which is a new form of innovative finance to try and um, accelerate uh, valuable investments like investing in educating girls. Can you explain a bit about how that works and why you chose that particular route of fundraising? Yeah, um, and, and I think the question of why we chose to go down that route is really fundamental. Um, we're finance ladies, and I won't, you know, I don't know that much about finance, <laughs> <laughs> so uh, you know, I can't speak that language. But for me. Coming from the ground up, it was uh, the intentions are slightly different. Uh, I see girls every single day who are not in school. I see that they're married off at the age of 10, 12. Um, you know, I've walked into grade one classrooms and said, how many girls are married and seen five to six hands up, you know, in rural, remote, and tribal areas. I've also, I mean, I've always, I've lived my, I mean, my entire career has been in the development sector. I know the ins and outs of the development sector, and I also know there are certain fundamental problems with the nonprofit sector. One of them is that we don't have a clear efficiency indicator. If you're a nonprofit that's very good at fundraising, you will exist for 80 years and you will do really well, and you will scale and whatever, but you may not necessarily be creating impact on the ground, right? And it's always worried me, it's like everybody wants scale, but how do we marry scale with impact? So that if that girl is you know, at risk of getting married, we are sure that she will actually be prevented and she will stay in school. So for me, the intention was saying, you know, Educate Girls grew very fast. It's grown in the last, we're not even 10 years old, but we've gone from 
50 schools to today we work over 20,000 schools, almost 2 million children. I can't visit 20,000 schools. How do I know that the organization is still creating value add for that last child, that last girl that we reach? Um, and, it, and again, the scale requires fuel. It requires funding. You know? So for me, the entire piece, and I'd read about you know, this payment by results, and I was like, oh, if we could just like, figure out a way to do it, maybe then I could build an organization that had delivering to impact or delivering to outcomes in its DNA. That's the real intention behind it, is how do you, I wanted to create a proof of concept where you can tie money to pure So outcomes. how does it work? The way it works is uh, the development impact bond, I'm the service provider, so I do the work on the ground. And there's an outcome payer that purchases the impact that I create. Which is? Which is two indicators. One is enrollment of out-of-school girls. And the second is learning outcomes, which is measured against uh, regular government schools. So there's a counterfactual. So you have to outperform the government schools. So you have to outperform. Um, and whatever, like let's say I outperform it by two units, those are the only two units I get paid for. If, you know. uh, so it's very, very tight in terms of you're only getting paid for the results that you're delivering. Uh, it's a three-year transaction. We've completed two years. So investors come in, and they, give me they the give you the money, capital, and they get a return based on whether you achieve those government, yeah. better than the government performances. Yeah. And then the, someone, this, the, a charity in this case, is, is funding, uh, is paying the investor if, if you succeed. So the charity is not. So I'm still getting a grant. No, sorry, the, the foundation. The, the outcome payer yeah. is paying back the investor. Yeah. Um, and, and that's... The kind, and everything is independently verified by and a And how much party. is the investor going to make if you succeed? So uh, just based on the two-year results, which are very strong, if I keep to the same level of performance, my investor should be on track to get about 108% back next year. So do you, you I mean, that, that should obviously be something, if you can get that kind of return, that the capital markets should be rushing yeah. for. What do you think is the needs to happen if, if you're going to really scale that up and be yes. able to get the whole system working that way rather than just... Yeah, I think, I, you know, India has an NGO for every 400 people. Mm. If every single NGO <laughs> started to deliver to real results and outcomes, we won't have, you know, we will accelerate, we will surpass the sustainable development goals mm. if that happened on the ground in terms of performance. And then if there was money that kind of fueled it and, you mm. know, uh, to be able to bring in private wells, to be able to bring in any investors possible. And the the biggest is bottleneck what? is The biggest bottleneck is really the outcome pairs. We need the government, we need tax-paying bodies to really start purchasing this outcome, and which has been slow. And yeah, it should be something that the government pays for because it's, risk it's the biggest benefit will go to the government in terms of less ta uh, higher tax returns, I guess, because you have girls that eventually start can earn a living. Perhaps and the so social forth. returns as yeah. well as, you know, it's risk-free. They only pay when the impact has been delivered and verified by a third party. Mm. So you'd think governments would be lining up for this. Except I've done 60 government meetings to try and convince them that this would be a great route for them to take. So why are they so reluctant? Because they're married to input-based financing. You know, they, they, it's which means what? Which means that um, you only want to fund based on inputs and outputs. It's teacher training. It's not learning outcomes. Mm. You know? and, uh, and we're saying we've got a template. And it's open source. You can just run with it. So all you need to do is do one pilot with us, and then you'll be ready to to do this on your own. Um, so all, all three of you, I, what as you look at the challenge of actually getting to the sustainable development goals and raising that addition, all that extra capital, what's the one thing that you see as the top priority over the next couple of years to to, to sort of attract a lot more of that outcomes-based funding? Uh, for me, it would be um, the ability to measure and communicate the outcomes in a way that is digestible by the audience we're trying to reach. But we have to develop track record and communicate that track record on impact and make it real and understandable, which is what the industry has been working towards. And I feel that that you know, is a, a, a critical need. And is that, is that to attract the attention of the the mainstream investors or is that is that a different who, who, who's, would, who's going to care about I, I would say I, I would say that everyone should so f governments for example I don't know the numbers in the United States but you think about all of the money that is spent on social programs and um, there's lack of information about the 
um, benefit of those social programs. So you have political wars about um, reducing the social programs. If we could actually talk about real benefits being produced, um, number one, you would fund the programs that are working and you would have legitimate arguments um, in society for, for why these merit those dollars, whether they are um, taxpayer dollars or co you know commercial dollars. I just think it's critical to be results oriented. Mm. Georgie? Yeah, for me, it's just a change of mindset. I think for better or worse, the situation, the political situation we are right now in the world has opened the conversation, so all the options are on the table. And just like all the options are on the table for what's negative in the world, they're likely there for what's positive. But it requires a total reshifting of the way of our expectations, of how we collaborate, and how we see the world. And just a one brief example is um, one of the deals that we're working with is a solar project, right? normal, boring, good return, but they've layered over um, a conservation side of it, so they're conser preserving the, the land uh, for rhinos and for elephants, they're providing livelihood for people. So if you use the sustainable development goals as a blueprint for what's possible and try to touch upon all of them as you go on in your conversations, in your discussions, um, and in your own projects and life, um, that change of mindset, I think, has a huge potential for breakthrough and scale. Savina. You're doing it. Yeah. Um, <laughs> you know, I yeah, I, I think we will reach a tipping point at, at, you know, maybe in a few years where we will see more outcome pairs. We will see maybe a lot of people are working on the outcome funds right now. Uh, so I'm kind of hopeful, but I think it's still like early days, maybe another three to four years perhaps. But our hope is really that we'll get to a stage in five years where we can work with five million children annually and that there will be uh, this kind of strategic outcomes-based funding available for it. And do you think, I mean, having the private sector involvement, you know, what, what does that do? Does that raise everyone's game or does it you know, create distractions from the, the mission of I achieving? think it depends on what kind of and what's the intention of that um, you know, funder coming on board. So, for example, our investor is invested in our success. So they helped us build a performance management system. They helped us build, you know, data systems that can help us kind of see where we're going and be able to respond and course correct, you know, faster. So having a private partner really played a, a very enabling role. But yes, if the private partner and the investors want to hold you by the throat, saying, where's my result, where's my result, then <laughs> obviously it's not going to be a very enabling environment. So I think it would depend on each investor and how they play uh, their role well. And how do you, I mean, how do you think we change the narrative around, you know, it's not what goes in, it's what comes out in terms of results? I think that um, it's an education process. Of course, I think the fact that we have a unifying theory like the UN Sustainable Development Goals is helpful because if people can galvanize around a common language, that's um, part of the, the battle, really. And... Um, the vocabulary that we all use in this space is 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 very uh, confusing otherwise. There's also a lot of confusion around uh, financial return, impact, trade-offs, friction, and what you need to develop is a group of um, people who have experience and judgment to say that there's a spectrum out there, that that spectrum is necessary of capital with different return profiles, either purely philanthropic or purely commercial, and that we need skilled people to go out and execute against each of the strategies. And it is a strategy, uh, a set of strategies. There is no one silver bullet mm. that will cure everything, and we all need to work together hand in hand. And at least if we have a common language or a common set of goals like the UN SDGs, that's, that's a huge help. And when you go and raise money from you know, these titans of finance <laughs> on Wall Street and you know, the pension funds and so forth. Are they starting to get it when you talk about this sustainable development goal? Yeah, framework? they are. It, it was definitely an education process for um, uh, groups, uh, you know, groups who have not been involved in our space. But I think what they appreciated, uh, number one, was that there was a third party framework out there that had been broadly accepted. And number two, if it's um, the United Nations brand on it, if you will, it's meaningful. And you can talk about how it's not just a private secretary initiative, you know, it's really all encompassing, but it is absolutely an education because most um, pension fund managers have, have barely heard of the UN SDGs, even the UN itself. So there's, there's a lot of education, <laughs> uh, <laughs> educating to be done, <laughs> right. 
Is that the same with the private <laughs> private families or not so no, much? the UN, yes, but they want it vetted. Mm. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> yes. Mm. And that's where Hamilton Lane mm. comes mm. on board, is how do you give, kind of, how you accelerate that, uh, that um, gap of trust uh, by having a third-party verifier, so to speak, yeah. to rate the cost sponsor that are, are coming along to share the deals, yeah. Mm. Uh, do we have any questions from anyone in the audience? Uh, yes, a gentleman over there. Sure. Um, we've been able to enroll about 87% of uh, the out-of-school girls, um, and 54% of them were above the age of 10, which is the much harder to reach mm. uh, group because they're at risk of child marriage, child labor, all kinds, you know, um, things. So what the bond is really teaching us that we can and we have strategies to actually crack it at the harder level, and that push came because of the performance management systems and really, you know, um, that results framework. Um, and on the learning end, we're outperforming uh, regular government schools by between 25 to 30% uh, between Hindi, English, and math. So very, very strong uh, results. And as, as I said, in terms of the financials, um, you know, the investor is estimated to recoup around 108% of their money back. So, yeah. so why, why do you think nonprofits have been so slow to do this kind of performance? management system like why it is it taking you, you naked in terms of your <laughs> impact <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> so it's it's just so much easier yeah. to kind of hide behind and not have to do that to that be is. accountable uh, you know to your beneficiary to that level you know wh everybody will know exactly how well educated girls performs on the ground at the end of this three years you know how good are we at the enrollment at retention at learning uh, and at what scale and what cost so all those three things just become, you know, then you can compare apples to apples. So where else, I mean, do you think there are lots of other areas like education where you could do the similar impact bond model? Absolutely. I think the measurable one, you can't do it for art and culture and peace and, you know. Uh, but I think anywhere, and actually that's the important bit, is that we aligned our outcomes to the SDGs and we hope that other transactions will do the same so that we don't have a marketplace of bespoke outcomes, which yeah. could then, you know, be more um, aligned for the investor to recoup their money versus really yeah. leading to ending poverty or uh, you know universal education. Yeah. Yeah. Any more uh, late, uh, down here? Yeah. Yeah. I don't yeah. think that yeah. human rights may really be the right outcome for such a transaction. Um, again, I think the measurable ones will lend themselves much more easily um, than something like, like human if rights. If I, if I can add to that, I think, I think that we're moving in that direction. It, it is much more much difficult to, to do, but I'll make a plug for you know a, a piece of work that Matthew works on, which is the uh, social progress imperative, mm -hmm. where various aspects of human rights are important in the approach and methodology, and um, there are very, very smart minds looking at how do you both collect data and then translate that into um, overall social value. Now, I think what, what, what the, the social impact bonds do, and I've always felt that the social impact bonds are at the tip of the spear because they are absolutely aggressively outcomes focused, number one, and number two, they quantify the outcome. So the investor puts up money, the investors get paid back, um, a sense of what is the value, what is the dollar value so to society of educating a girl, which is very hard work to do. And I think we are seeing progress towards tackling the more difficult categories like human rights. I don't, I haven't heard about arts and culture yet, <laughs> but, but human rights, yeah. I, know, I know we're trying to move. Well, certainly, I think one of the things that's happening with measurement of some of these social outcomes is that we're starting to see actually that if you invest in them, um, they are actually very good investments. So like the, I think the evidence on investing in women, companies that give a much greater role for women is sort of pretty yeah. impressive that actually that's a good investment strategy. That's right. And I think we'll see some of the same with some of these other areas. Um, I want to, I mean, uh, up there, yeah, please. A lady on the right there, halfway up, yeah. Hi, thank you so much for this panel. Uh, my name is Emily Pryor and I run Data2x, which is focused on global gender data. And I'm just loving this panel, so interesting. And I'm wondering, 
Um, you were talking about you know, having the importance of communicating clearly the results, the data, measuring those outcomes, and this great framework that we have in the SDGs. However, we also know that there's a real dearth of data availability, not only in gender, which, where there's a huge one, yeah. but um, across uh, the, the various SDGs. Yeah. So I'm curious about this from an investment perspective. Yeah. <laughs> when you're having to report back, when you know, there's yeah. very clear metrics involved, you know, how is the investment community thinking about this, yeah. approaching it? Are there investments being made in yeah. those underlying data systems? I'd love to hear your perspective on that. Thank you. Sure. Um, I'll, I'll just give you the Rise Fund's perspective, which is, you know, one, one unit and not everybody's. But we feel that, again, another contribution that we're making with our work is we're um, identifying where gaps in evidence exist. And what we have um, thought about is... Uh, Working collaboratively with foundations who have a real sort of mission alignment around advancing um, certain, you know, certain uh, core core interest areas of themselves, and and in our conversations with uh, with foundations, they've been very excited about the notion of um, unearthing where the big gaps in the evidence are and funding them. Um, and I think it's that kind of collaborative, and that's where uses of capital can be really um, elegantly applied, where you have philanthropic dollars going towards studying so that we know um, whether there's efficacy around, you know, a variety of things, some, some interventions in healthcare, clean cook stoves, you know, certain types of microcredit loans. Are they good, bad, indifferent? Where is the research um, uh, falling through? Where is it non-existent? Because it also helps you to figure out what can I retool and do better? So I think there is a, a very strong um, side uh, bar here, which is what don't we know? Mm -hmm. And how can we bring capital sources together to figure out um, how to calibrate whether you know doing something will be good or not? Mm -hmm. So we're almost out of time. I want to ask each of you to wrap up by really addressing what people in the audience here and people watching can do um, to, to, to help shift finance in the right direction, whether they're people who are running organizations that are trying to achieve the SDGs mm -hmm. through their work, but also us as investors, us as consumers. Um, Georgie, why don't you start? Yes, absolutely. So uh, it's a very mixed audience. So what I would say, there's so much innovation. Keep getting inspired. I think what's beautiful about the sustainable development goals is how much can we learn from each other. So as opposed to you know staying in a single vertical, what is happening in the other sectors of innovation uh, that could be applied, and that applies to finance, that applies to how we manage. Uh, there's a great site called uh, Sustainia. It's out of the Danish government. They have uh, mapped around 4,500 different innovations related to the SDGs. And there, again, you can get very much um, in tune with, which, with what's happening and uh, try to understand it and try to adapt it. Sophia. Yeah. Um, so I think I'd like to actually just go back on that um, because you're so right. For all of these to work, how are you going to exist in environments where data is not so solid? So. Just to give a practical example, we get paid on enrollment of an out-of-school girl and as per her age, seven, eight years and plus, but there's no age proof at a village level. And so really at the core of it is for these financial instruments and for investors to have trust, the measurement system is going to become so focused on the measurement system, they will have to be built with a thick layer of empathy around them. Mm. That's what we had to do. We had to constantly go back and say it's not going to work because there is no age proof because th the children are born at home. How are we going to do this? And really process alignment, working with all parties together to, to do it. And really, like I said, it's empathy and really bringing that to the table um, more you know, with the finance and with the measurement. Right. I'll finish quickly. I would say you know, echoing uh, one of the panels earlier today, just be bold. Figure out where your passion is. Figure out what uh, side of the, uh, of the entire landscape you can play in and be bold. Time is short. We have one life to live. We want to make this planet better. We want to make our society better. And we are a collaborative effort. Um, so just reach out and, and, and figure out what you are best placed to do and, and get engaged, get involved. Great. Well, I think this has been a really stimulating conversation by three uh, pioneering leaders in, in this area. So thank you all very much. Thank you, Matthew. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs>